Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, glad to have you here again. Um, I don't know really who's watching, but it uh, seems like somebody is there. That's nice. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you join me in the chat. So uh, feel free to register at Twitch um, and say something in the chat. I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, I don't feel alone, but uh, I meant this format to be interactive. So I'd be really happy to uh, hear something from you, uh, to uh, perhaps uh, hear how you like it or what you want me to, uh, to talk about here, because um, there are lots of things that might interest you perhaps and uh, not just me so feel free and uh, join the chat say hello um, I will welcome you and um, otherwise I just see the numbers of people watching which is fine but uh, yes let's get interactive let's collaborate together and see what it is like to do this show together well tonight uh, I want to um, deal with uh, a topic that is getting a little bit complicated but i thought about what's next is it is this show a feature show for gitlab and should i introduce the concepts of uh, gitlab and git one after the other and i thought um, i should show something that comes out of it for you and is uh, of some kind of value for you uh, before i get into the details so um, this episode i want to talk about uh, and show things that have to do with GitLab and Docker. Docker is uh, a technology that is deeply integrated in the concept of GitLab. They both work together in a very uh, smart way. Because if you followed me along in the previous episodes, you saw something that you already knew, I guess. You could up and download files, you could replace them, you could even enter some simple text in form fields and probably you thought um, well I can do this with WordPress and it's much better it looks better I don't know what the purpose of all this stuff is so and I thought about this uh, that you could have this in mind and I want to give you an impression of the potentials of building stuff with GitLab today and as I said before GitLab and Docker they both work together in a very flexible and smart way. So what I'm going to talk about and show tonight is uh, um, the further development of our very simple project. Uh, I guess you, re you remember, oopsie, that's me. See, um, I have to switch this here. <laughs> um, this is the project of Paula Peterson. She is, uh, at the same state as she was last week so i did not change anything and uh, it's still the report on animals in the neighborhood so um, what i want to do today is uh, show how the simple text that we have here which is uh, this file and some other files can be transformed or converted into a different output. And I take this as an example for that you can build anything you have in mind with GitLab. Well, not, a, not everything, not everything that you think of, but um, I want to give you an impression of the potentials of building stuff with GitLab in a collaborative way. So the first thing is let's, let's recap what we did. Um, there is a markdown file here and it's called readme.md. And the markdown file is uh, rendered in the browser because GitLab does that for us. So if you uh, think of what we did before, you cl can click on the readme file and you can click on edit. And you can, well, I click on this soft wrap here. And um, you can um, add text, you can change text and uh, add markdown text and formatting in this text file. And then you, you click on commit changes and what you did gets added to the version history and a new state of the file is being saved in the, in the system. So let's do this here. Let's just uh, be lazy and copy this paragraph and paste it again. 
down here and just say uh, birds in the neighborhood. So, and if I, if I click here, well, I say add birds just to make a difference here. Um, if I click here uh, on commit changes, this is the commit event. Well, sp speaking from another perspective of the GitLab system, um, GitLab just um, noticed that someone committed something. Well, this gets important in the next step. Well, um, as I said before, collaborating on these files in GitLab is uh, simple. If you get used to that, you just uh, do what I, I showed, uh, open a file, edit it, um, save it again as committing it. But let's think of a scenario from another perspective, not from the technical perspective, but from um, a domain perspective or from a more social perspective. People working with these systems, they want things to get published. They want things to get built. They want things to get calculated. So there's always an intention behind collaboration in these systems. Well, let's take WordPress again. The idea of putting text and pictures into this form fields and then click on uh, publish or um, update, uh, the intention behind that is to get text and other artifacts published on the web. And you take WordPress for that because uh, everything else is quite complicated because you would have to write HTML, you would have to know how to write PHP or Python to get such a website system running as WordPress is. It. So WordPress is therefore a very widespread content management system for all purposes. So you can blog with it, you can make web shops with it, you can make learning environments with uh, WordPress. I, you can think of everything that it is for. So it's a very universal um, content management system. And my point uh, tonight is that GitLab is also a very universal um, content management system, but in another way. It's not just for websites. It is for building everything that can be built with your hands on the computer if you know how to do it. So that means you can use your computer in a very nerdy way because you have to type text commands or you have to uh, exactly know what to type, what kind of command you have to type so that your computer does something. So most people uh, are not used to that and they don't need that. This is not something that can be criticized, um, but many people are not uh, used to that and they don't need that. And I want to show that uh, this stuff that is very mighty and has a high potential putting things on your computer with text commands and uh, um, in an unusual and non-graphical way, that this can be transferred into GitLab to get uh, you um, in a position of very conveniently doing stuff with GitLab and building documents, articles, websites, blog articles, open educational resources, or even books. And uh, to get started with that, I would like to introduce you to um, something that we have not yet uh, switched on. Because uh, on the left hand side, you see something here uh, that is um, that ha we have configured in the first episode. So what we want to do is we want to build a PDF file out of this markdown document here. This is the first thing we're going to do. So uh, the idea is to make a PDF document out of this markdown file without using your computer at all. So I want to do this within GitLab. So let's see how we can do that and explain the steps one after the other and uh, look back and see what happens. So let's do something first. First of all, uh, for what I want to do is um, I have to switch on something that I switched off in the first episode um, due to uh, complexity reasons. I wanted to uh, scale down the sidebar here. So if I go to settings right now, um, I can have another thing here, and this is pipelines. I can switch on pipelines 
And this gives us another thing here, another menu entry on the left-hand side. So if I do this, I switch on the pipelines and click Save Changes. The sidebar gets updated and I get something that is called CICD. CICD is uh, short for continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Um, not quite sure what it is, what is meant here, but uh, both are fine. The idea is that whenever people collaborating on a project in GitLab, the way I showed before, whenever they do that, um, their work gets integrated as fast as possible. Um, that has to do with, uh, the, of course, that, uh, that needs some quality check, but uh, we're going to talk about quality checks in a later episode. But the idea is that whenever someone works on a project, he or she adds value to the project. At least the management of the project should be designed in a way that whenever someone works on the project, value for somebody, for the customer, for the student, or for the reader, or whoever, is being added. So taking this into account, um, you don't want to wait for weeks till what you committed or what you contributed gets added to the project. You want to see this immediately. This means um, that whenever people contribute, they see what they did because it gets integrated continuously and everybody learns from that. That is something that comes from the Agile movement where you learn fast, you fail fast, and you see what everybody contributes very fast so that everybody can learn and see, ah, well, this is what we did. This is not what we wanted. Let's change it. And let's change it fast and not after weeks. So continuous integration and also continuous delivery or continuous deployment are um, workflow methods or pro project management aspects that mean that we whatever we do gets built into the whole product immediately. So CI CD offers us some pipeline uh, menu. And let's have a look uh, here. What can we see here? Nothing. So get started with pipelines. This is what I want to do. So I want to show you how we can configure a pipeline that whenever we add something to the readme file, builds a PDF out of that. And we will see in another example later that we can even build complex websites the same way. So, um, well, I spoiled it a little bit now. Well, doesn't matter. Uh, the thing is that we have to add a special kind of file to a project in the first place. So we can click here, get started with pipelines, but I want to show you a short, uh, a short way to uh, a quick uh, product. So I go back to the landing page and now I go to the plus sign here that you already know and say, I want to have a new file here. And I'm going to call the file um, .gitlab minus um, ci.yaml. YML is short for YAML and it's a special um, file format that is very strict. You can easily um, build a file that won't work. So what I do now is I take a template, I apply a template that um, GitLab gives me and uh, this makes it much easier. Um, I advise you to uh, copy and paste a lot so that you have a stable files or you use um, so, um, some kind of tool that shows you what can go wrong in your YAML file. So let's see how that looks like. Um, as you can see, uh, the GitLab CI YAML, short for GitLab Continuous Integration Configuration File, um, has lots of examples here. So perhaps you spot something that you like, but for example, for those who write LaTeX, um, we can have, we can use this one here. Uh, we will do in a moment. So there's Python, there's Ruby. Um, there are lots of um, configuration files on templates here that we can use. See, there's also a Hugo file and, um, well, many others. You can scroll through them yourself. And I'm going to take this LaTeX file as an example. So if I click on here, we get this pasted here. And it says something here at the beginning. So, um, 
right so um i will no i will leave that for you you can read this but i will go down a little bit and i will zoom in so that we can see everything very well so first of all um i said that i want to introduce you to the um to the best body of gitlab which is uh, docker Docker, as we will see on websites that we will browse later, is a container virtualization technology. That means a Docker image contains everything and not more that is needed to execute a certain program or command. So it's, it's like a virtual mach machine, if you're used to virtual machines. It's like a virtual machine that you can spin up with... Um, graphical user interface and for example Windows or Linux or whatever um, operating system you take and it will do whatever you want inside your computer as a separated system. So it's a virtual system. It's not installed on your physical hardware. Um, but most of the time in scenarios like this one you don't need a graphical user interface because you do not even can click on it because it runs somewhere on computers that are remotely installed or something so we don't need complex and um, um, complex virtual machines with much resources on them we just need tiny little computers virtual computers computers that are stored in images and whenever we want them we can say now we want to have one could i please have a virtual machine um let's say can i have a container so um from a docker image you can spin up a container the container does something for you concrete it executes a program that was built into the image and then the container usually dies or gets destroyed because you don't save them for later Whenever you need a new container, you spin up another one. And the process that we're dealing with here is taking an image, a Docker image, and in the process of the pipeline, spin up a container to do something with a source code. In this example, to do something with the readme file. I don't want to do this with a LaTeX image. I want to do this with Pandoc. Pandoc is um, a little program that is run on the command line and it's very, very powerful. It can convert text formats from one side to the other. So in this example, I want to convert a markdown file to a PDF. So what I need is I need an image and I want the latest version of it, a Pandoc um, image that has LaTeX included so that I can convert the markdown file to LaTeX and then to a PDF. So this is very black box like now. Please be patient. I will explain later on. So we take this image. The question is, where does the image come from? Later, I'm going to show you what comes out of this first and then we're going to analyze this. So we're going to take a Docker image for, of Pandoc um, and we're going to build something. And this script line here is the command that everybody everybody would have to type on his or her own computer to do what i'm now doing on the server where gitlab is running so no need to type pandoc readme.md dash o means output file readme.pdf this is something you should you would have to type on your computer but you don't have to because we configure the pipeline that the pipeline does it for you and you don't even get in touch with some kind of terminal or shell or whatever um, there is to do this on your computer now the next line is um, after building something out of the readme.md uh, precisely the pdf file it's called an artifact. What comes out of this pipeline is called an artifact. And we want to save this artifact for later because just generating it and throwing it away is not the purpose that we're heading up. So we're going to save everything that ends with PDF. So this is it. So take the Docker image, configure something that has to be built. Um, precisely, this is the line that we want to be 
I want to have executed, and then we want to save what comes out of it as an artifact for later. So I'm going to zoom out again, and then I commit the changes here. And what we're going to have from that is, of course, a new file, as you can see. Well, let's get syntax highlighting highlighted. This is quite nice. And then we go to the landing page again and see there's the new file. It's called .gitlab CIYAML. And now there's something that is interesting. Let's see the pipelines. I open up a new tab and we see now here a line that just started. It says here in blue, there's the test running. And I click on running and I see there's uh, the pipeline. It's just this stage here. I go on to this here and we see something that looks a little bit like a terminal. So that means uh, this, um, this terminal um, is on the GitLab computer. Now it's passed. Well, this was fast. You see, the light is green, everything is fine, and something happens here. So we found, uh, we found here there was something happening. So let's analyze this for short. We said we want a Docker image. Um, the Docker image is being pulled and it's being used. So as I explained before, the, from the Docker image, a little computer, um, a so-called container, uh, spins up. Inside the container, the, the command pandoc readme.md-o readme.pdf is run with our contents of the GitLab repository. So um, what comes out of it should be a PDF file, but um, it's, uh, it's somewhere here. So where is it? Let's see what we find when we click on Browse. Ah, oh, see, there's a PDF file. So if I click on this PDF file, this comes out of it. So from the Markdown file, we generated this PDF file. So how, how is that? Um, again, um, first of all, you have to configure your pipeline. This is what you do here. And um, we said, please take this image. And the question now is, where does it come from? And then build with this command, build the PDF. Now, if you don't put something else here, instead of uh, some kind of name first, and then a slash, and then something afterwards, GitLab goes to the Docker Hub. So let's explore the Docker Hub. The Docker Hub is a free online platform. You can compare it to GitHub. And this online platform is um, um, this online platform is built for hosting Docker images for others to use them. So it's the idea of not sharing source code as we want to do it in GitLab or as people do on GitHub. It's let's say, sharing virtual machines. And the idea is great because um, I can have a little computer, a virtualized computer, within seconds that gives me everything that I need to run a Ruby script or a Python script. You and me, we don't have to install this natively on our computer. Sometimes we don't even have the rights to do so because we're working with machines at work and we are not, uh, we don't have root rights or administrative rights. So we need um, a computer that does something for us and we take a Docker image, spin up a Docker container and build something with the Docker container. Now let's see, what do we find here? If I search for Pandoc, we will see that it is, that there is a Pandoc LaTeX image. So it was updated two days ago. It is the latest version that I wanted. And as you can see here, this is what I put into my GitLab CI YAML. And then I get, got a tag at the end, latest version. I could have typed in a um, um, certain version, an older version of the image due to some kind of legacy features that I need or something, whatever the reason is. But you can look for Docker images here and use them for the production in pipelines, as I show with this very simple example. 
So, for example, if you need a Docker image that has uh, that can execute Python code, there's um, even an official image of Python that you can use to just execute Python code in the pipeline. For example, you're doing some machine learning stuff or you want something to be calculated and uh, you want everybody in your team to contribute, but it's not possible that everybody who contribute, contributes can execute this Python script on his or her own computer. So they need to have it executed on a remote computer and this is what we're talking about today, uh, configuring GitLab for executing source code with programs that come in Docker images. Now, let's go back to the script here and um, talk about the next one. So the script line here is just one line. It can be a longer script. It's the command that is being executed in the Docker container that we use for the pipeline running. So whenever the pipeline runs, we use a Docker container and we destroy the Docker container afterwards because it doesn't cost us anything except for some seconds to spin another one up, a fresh one. So we have a reproducible building environment, which is quite nice um, because everybody has the same circumstances. I guess you know some stories about people who are uh, on the phone and say, well, on my computer it's running. Why isn't it running on your computer? All that the thing is that people have different configurations on their computer and you don't get a reproducible environment on both of these machines and it gets worth with more people involved. So you have a reliable Docker image that is always the same. You know how it is configured and you can use it in the pipeline. It, don't gets, it doesn't get tired. So, well, this is the example here and um, this is what we can do with Docker in this very simple example. Now let's see how the pipeline again runs. Um, I go back and now let's imagine a contribution scenario where people are contributing to um, this file. So they open it up as we know it and they edit it. And uh, well, let's just add something that can uh, that everybody will notice that it changes. So in the frogs paragraph, I add this again. So in the result of our pipeline, we should see this twice. It wasn't there before. So I click on commit changes and this commit event triggers the pipeline. This is why I mentioned this before, because the, the commit event triggers the pipeline again. So I click here. And now I go to the CICD pipelines page to just watch what's happening. So you see there's again a pipeline running. I want to see what's inside. So I click here. I see there's one job. I click here again and I want to see what's going on. So usually after pulling the Docker image once, it's, it's being cached. So this will go faster than for the first time. I don't know how the gitlab.com docker runner is um, configured. I don't know how it caches or if it caches. Could be that you always, because it's a service for free, have to wait some longer time, but um, well, it's quite fast. It's not so fast as using WordPress and clicking publish or update, but uh, therefore it's it has much more power because you can build anything as you will see afterwards. So job succeeded. Here you can download or browse the job artifacts, which is the readme.pdf. Let's go and see again what's here in browse. Go to the readme PDF. And let's see what's up here. Well, the first time and here the second time. So, and for me, that's very fascinating. I use this every day in collaborative scenarios because um, it makes it possible for many people to collaborate on different types of works. For this might be a scientific article where many people work on, but it also might be a book where many people contribute. And whenever they contribute, um, the system that I configured generates a PDF file. And um, you can download it from 
another place. So if you go to the landing page, there's also the download button for the artifacts. So if you click here, you can download the latest artifacts that are called build. Well, this is the name of it. So if you click on this one, you will get a zip archive with everything in it that was built by the latest pipeline. So this has a, and this has a great potential and um, building with Docker um, is not just uh, focused on building text things. I love this. I love building things with Pandoc and with Docker and in this pipeline scenario. But this must not be your perspective. Perhaps you want to have um, a static website. Static websites is another thing that I love because um, there's no uh, MySQL or whatever database involved. It's uh, a process where a computer program generates static website files, so HTML files, CSS files, uh, from a source code. And if you deploy these static website files, they it's, it's difficult to hack them. They are very fast because there's no database that has to be queried and no PHP script has to run to render the website. It's after click, it's there immediately. And um, if you leave after two years at your job and you have a project website running on WordPress, uh, you need somebody who cares for it. Like uh, if you go on holiday and you have your cat at home, someone has to feed it. So if you have a WordPress installation and you leave uh, the place, there has to be someone who cares for the WordPress installation, like for the cat. Otherwise, the updates will, um, will um, or the, the vulnerabilities of the, of the WordPress installation uh, will make the website very insecure and uh, perhaps the PHP version of the updated server doesn't fit. So I'm very fine with static websites because they are fast, they are secure, they are nearly not hackable, and uh, this is everything I need. But um, building static websites always involves the terminal. And I want to give you an impression of what the terminal is. I don't know if you ever used it, but uh, this is the terminal. I, I made it, uh, I, I, uh, I zoomed in a lot. So um, let's see. Well, this is the terminal. So, and I, um, I made uh, uh, a folder for tonight. And it includes um, a folder, another folder that's called Panoc, just for the example. And this, what I'm doing here, uh, involves some knowledge that you need to have to navigate this terminal. And I think it's not a good idea to tell people that they have to learn this in order to use the cool tools. And uh, well, from my perspective, uh, static site generators like Hugo or like Jekyll or Gitbook or even Pandoc, they are very fascinating tools because they can do this static website stuff. But to get people in the position of using these tools um, without having to learn this command line thing here, um, it's cool to have this in the pipeline configuration. So and this is what I want to show you, how to get um, a website builder, my favorite one right now is Hugo, um, into this pipeline context and show you how you can get a universal content management system with GitLab where everybody can contribute to the files um, and with this continuous integration, continuous delivery thing, after seconds, a new website is being built. So and I want to try this out to get you another impression of what you can do with this pipeline configuration. It's not just about text, it's also about complex systems. So let's go back to the, to the browser and build a new project. So um, the new project should be, um, well, no, this is not where I want to go to. I want to go to this page. So I want to build a new project and tinker around a little bit with it. So um, you can try this for your own. So I could type in everything as we did in the first episode, but I want to use something that is uh, being created from a template because it's faster and uh, it's the same that you have. So it's not my knowledge, it's, you can use it from everywhere. 
So you see there's a built-in um, library or gallery of, of um, very common um, projects and programming languages. And what we see here is pages slash Hugo. I will go with this one, but first of all, I want to show you uh, what you can see, uh, what you will find behind it. So it opens up a new tab and it's a, a repository of its own on the gitlab.com website. And as you can see here, it is, of course, a file tree uh, with certain folders and with certain files. It also has the GitLab CI YAML, it has a README, and it has three folders. It's called Content, Static, and Themes. So, And what I want to do now is, when I generate this or when I create this new project here, I want to take this template and import this and build the new project from this template. Well, this is one way to show or to get started. We will change some things, but uh, see what, it's, what it uh, gives us in the first place. So I use this template. I call it um, Hugo example. So um, an example of building static websites with GitLab, Docker, and Hugo. So I make this a public project so that you can request access and you can join. I showed this in the first or second episode. So I create the project and now the repository that I showed before gets imported into my project, which is freshly built. So even an avatar or a project logo is being imported. So same thing as we saw before, it was just an import. And let's explore the files here a little bit. So the interesting thing is, is there some content? So if we go here, we have another folder hierarchy. The first is page. Aha, there's an about page. Let's see what's inside. A markdown file. My name is the dude. I have the following qualities. All right, this is the about side. And I go back in the background path to the content folder. And I want to see what's in the post folder. Well, several posts, obviously, of a blog. All right, so let's see what comes out of that. So what's about soccer here? Okay, so this is obviously a markdown file. I go and add it, and we can see it also has a YAML front matter here, and it has some text here. Great. So what about, yes, I want to leave the page. So what about all this pipeline stuff? Um, let's see what the GitLab CI YAML says. There is one, so let's analyze this. Well, it's a little bit longer, it, it's a little bit, perhaps a little bit more complicated, but the first line, or the second line here, is uh, obviously something that, we seen, that we've seen before. Um, what we've seen before is there is um, the name of um, the Docker image, but it comes from another registry. So the Docker Hub that I showed before, this here, is a so-called a registry. You can think of um, some kind of a garage where you can park Docker images in and you can get them out of there again when you need them. So a Docker registry is a, is a, is a storage where you can put Docker images, you can push them and pull them, update them, and you can set up, because it's open source software, you can set up um, a Docker registry of your own. So let's see. So this comes from the registry from gitlab.com, not from the Docker app. It's fine for me. This is something I will explain later. But here is, um, in this um, hierarchy of the YAML file syntax, there, is, there are two stages. One stage is the test stage. And I want to edit this and rename it. I want to call it build. Um, because test is a, is a name that means really test, but I want to build something. Now, let's see. It says the script is Hugo. This was before it was pandoc readme.md minus o readme.pdf. Now it's just Hugo because the command to build a website, an HTML website from this file tree that we saw before is just Hugo. Well, it's very simple.
So, but this will just be executed on branches that are not called master. So, as we saw before, there are it's possible to have different branches. I explained that branch thing uh, because we configured something for convenience in the last episode. But uh, what we see here is um, this stage is just executed on branches that are not the master branch. The other thing is that the pages thing is obviously just executed on the master branch. Well, GitLab pages is a special concept. I don't want to talk about this uh, about this here because uh, it's a special concept. It's a great concept, but I want to I want to talk about the general um, potentials of GitLab, and this is not just pages. It's uh, the the um, the concept of building whatever you think of and do something special afterwards. So send a mail. Um, Push it on the next cloud, deploy it on a web server, whatever. This is the this is the flexible potential of GitLab. And Pages is a special use case. I don't want to talk about in this episode. I want to show you the the flexibility that you can build and push and deploy and send and upload everything that you build with GitLab um, in this pipeline concept. So let me add something. Um, I want to add this here. So we want to save the artifacts for later. So and the path is the same. We want to save uh, the public folder that gets generated by Hugo uh, when the building, the build stage is being run. So this is what I want. So let's see what happens here. Um, I execute this. I commit the changes. Excuse me. And now let's see what happens. So as we saw before, I close these here. As we saw before, um, there should be a pipeline running. Let's see, is there, is there a pipeline running? Yeah, there's a pipeline running. That's great. So what happens here? It's running on the master branch. Okay, so this one is pulling. Um, this one is pulling the Docker image, and it's uploading artifacts, uploading artifacts to coordinator. Let's see. Uh, let's go to the browse. And oh, this was too fast. I go back. That was a double click. So there's the public folder. And now we have here uh, a new file tree. This was generated. So this is, if you're used to website architecture, it's the index.html file. And it's um, a CSS folder with CSS files in it. So this is what GitLab, Docker, and the Hugo image build out of a repository. Now, let's see how, how does that look like. So if we go back here, if we go back here, um, we should download this. So let's go here and download the pages artifacts. So if we do this, um, we save them. So you don't see that. Uh, but I go back to the terminal and show you something. Sorry. I go back to the terminal. So, and I want to move from the, my downloads folder, the artifacts to temp shaping openness. So, and I go to, I change the directory and go to temp shaping openness and list the files that are in there. Okay, this is an artifacts zip folder. This is what I downloaded. This is what I just downloaded. So, um, I can unzip this with this command, unzip artifacts, this is what comes out of it. So if I clear the page and list again, we now have the artifacts zip file, but we also have a public folder. So I move into the public folder with CD and list the content of the public folder. 
And this is exactly what we saw before, just sorted differently. Sorted differently. It's exactly what we saw in the browser as the result of the pipeline. Um, what does it look like? So we have to start a server now. And uh, I can simulate this because I know how it works, but keep in mind that perhaps you don't know what I'm doing here. It's the first time you see it. And I wouldn't go so far and say, well, if you want to work like that, you have to know everything in the terminal. This is exactly what I don't want to tell here. This is just showing the complexity of what you need to know and what is necessary to run this on, on computers um, if we want to deal with this technology. And this is not my point. My point is that we encapsulate this complexity in the pipeline and the Docker images running in GitLab so that nobody needs to know exactly what's going on here. If they want to know, they can learn it. But if they want to use the system, we hide the complexity behind the GitLab uh, continuous integration configuration that I showed before. So this is just to explain what's behind it and give us a cliffhanger for the next episode. How can I avoid this and deploy a static website to a web server without really diving into it that deep that it, yeah, that we can see here. So again, we're in this public folder and when we want to deliver this website now. So I use a Python module that is called HTTP.server. And this starts a web server on port 8000, which I can now uh, open up in the browser. So I go back into the browser and I open up the local host on my computer on port 8000. There we go. This is what we just built with the pipeline. Um, let's see if we find the dude again. So let's go to about, well, my name is the dude. There he is. So this is what we generated with the GitLab pipeline. Now, if we want to update this one, um, why you'd want to hang out with me. So let's change this line here. Everybody knows now, I think, who watched how this goes. This is not a secret. So we can go back here and we know it's in the content folder. It's on the page. It's the about page. And now we added this one. And uh, there's the subtitle. Let's say I'm a cool guy. So this is the change that we do. Now I commit this. Oh, well, this uh, I hit Control Enter, which is the same as clicking on the commit button. Uh, I didn't tell you. So this is the same as clicking right down here. Now there's a change. There's again a pipeline running. We can see this in the pipelines tab. The pipeline is running. You know what's behind that. It takes some time. It's uh, downloading the image to execute the Hugo website generator. This is what it did. And there are the artifacts. We can have a look here. And as it is a page, I guess we find it here. And uh, the about page is this one. So, oh, this is cool. It opens up in a new tab. I'm a cool guy. So as you can see, this is still here on a GitLab uh, page. And uh, the reason for this URL is that this is the pages concept. This is a cool concept. This is a good. So if you're interested in why this is published online, read the documentation about GitLab pages. It is cool. But um, this is some kind of a black box. This is cool. It's fast. But I want to I want to deal with our concept because it gives us in the next episode we're going to see more flexibility what we can do with the artifacts, not just put it somewhere where GitLab does it for us. I didn't configure that. Pages is a concept that is built in here and it just happens. I want to go back here and I want to I, I want to show you that um, updating our website locally means downloading the whole stuff again. So I have to download this again. I have to move it in the terminal um, again to the place where the server is running, unpack it, 
and so on and so on. This is something nobody would do. And it doesn't make sense to host the website on my computer. So it must be hosted somewhere else. For example, you have a project website uh, for work or for a um, research project. And you have a machine running at the university or at your company. And it's, uh, it's web space that you want to use. So you need to know how to deploy the artifacts of such a pipeline to this web space. Another scenario that we started with is you have a report, a research report that you want to build in a collaborative way, as we said before, with GitLab. And whenever somebody commits something, the report should be generated and should be, for example, sent by mail to somebody, or it should be uploaded into a Nextcloud, or it should be converted into various formats with Pandoc. I'm going to show this later. This was just a short example of the potentials of Pandoc. But um, you want to have different formats out of this markdown file, a PDF file, an HTML file, um, a, a, doc, um, a Word document file. This is what you can build of it. So the scenarios vary. And uh, the, the question is, what can I do with the artifacts? And in the next episode, uh, I want to think about uh, what I can do in the next episode. Perhaps it's this one. But what can we do with the artifacts later on? How can we deploy this website to somewhere else? Or can we deal with this pipeline in a sophisticated way that fits our needs? How does that work? So um, let's go back to the browser here. And um, go back to the Hugo example. So, um, well, I think this is all for now. Um, uh, again, I want to ask you, uh, in the chat, perhaps you want to answer me, what should we deal with in the next episode? Perhaps you have some ideas. And uh, I'd be happy if you give me a, a hint. If you like this, if it's too fast, if it's too slow, if it's too complicated, or if there's something that you like to um, check out with me together, because I think the funny or the, the, um, the, f uh, the playful examples uh, come up if we do this uh, not even knowing each other, but collaboratively in this scenario that we work together on a GitLab project. I'd be happy to test this out um, because then things happen that I haven't planned. Of course, I have planned something for the episode, but I'd like to see what happens uh, if we work together here. Well, that's all for now. Um, please uh, have a look at uh, the Vimeo website um, that I uh, set up to host all the further, the previous episodes. And please um, write me something on Twitter or here on Twitch or on Vimeo, what you want to see in the next episode. Uh, if you had some problems, if you want to try out something, and uh, I'd be happy to see you again next week. Thanks for watching.